Wow, you know what I was thinking during praise and worship? Wasn't, I mean, that was powerful, wasn't it powerful? What if that, that presence, that sense of God, that spirit just never left? We were just surrounded by the presence of God all day long. Wouldn't that be amazing? Amazing. And uh, I was handed a note during praise and worship, um, and it says that our good sister, um, Sarah, uh, apparently has attempted uh, to commit suicide again. Now, those of you that are aware of the situation, this is maybe the fourth or fifth time that this has happened. And I just want you to believe with me that she's going to get delivered from this demon spirit that's trying to kill her. I, I held this note up all during praise and worship, and I just lifted her up before the Lord, and I said, deliver her, deliver her. Amen, no more. I'm so sick of this junk. And uh, you know what? God is too. God is real, and he's on the throne. And this is, you know, the evil that we live with on this earth. And we are... The army of God. I was going to tell uh, Rick Rogers, maybe we need to take a battalion of people where she is at, and we need to get her delivered from this thing because it needs to stop. Amen? We just want to lift up Stephanie, her mom, and um, Roger, and her brother Aaron, and uh, let's just pray for him right now. Heavenly Father, we just lift Sarah up before you, Father. Right now, Father, I pray for deliverance, Father, for her soul, Lord God, that this thing, Father, which uh, causes her to believe that she should die, Father, that it would die in the name of Jesus and that Sarah would live to proclaim the glory of God in her life, Father. We just take authority now in the name of Jesus, and we praise you and we thank you for your name, Father. Uh, if there's anyone who would be willing to t do that, um, let's talk with uh, Brother Rick after church and see if we can do that. You know what? That's what we're called to do. We are the body of Christ. Amen? And this is one of our very own, and it just makes, it just ticks me off. Um, Ruth Ann Miser's son, Chad, also was stepped on by a bull, and a, um, he's a bull rider, and uh, Obviously, the bull got the best of him this time, but no, 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 no. He's not going to stay down. So we're going to, I want you to pray for him, and we will have, um, we'll keep him in prayer. They don't know yet if he's going to have surgery or what. Uh, he has several fractures in his neck. And so I want you to keep lifting him up before the Lord as well. And Ruthann, Ruthann is getting married here in just a couple weeks. So praise the Lord. Um, I thought I would uh, say hello to my wonderful husband who's at home today. And those of you that weren't here on Wednesday night, you haven't heard that uh, Pastor Rick has shingles, which is adult chicken pox. And uh, I don't know what the devil th is up to, but um, we're not going, he's not going to hinder us in any way. So um, I just want you to keep him lifted up in prayer. Actually, he's doing very well. We were, we caught it early and, and, uh, but, um, he is not here reluctantly today, but, but uh, surely because he wants to keep you protected. If there's anyone with a weakened immune system undergoing chemotherapy or new babies, which I know we have some, uh, we don't want to be a danger to them. And so I just thank God for my husband. He is an awesome man of God, and uh, we love him, and he'll be back. He'll be back this week. So uh, he told me this morning, he said, Diane, you, you and I are one flesh, and, and you are the, the other half of my anointing. And, you know, this weekend there was the um, camp meeting at uh, Amazing Grace Church in Wheeler. I don't, some of you attended. We saw the back of your heads because we, we were watching the telecast. And actually, Dr. Barkland, Friday night, had a, a, he prophesied, uh, had a prophecy for Rick and I, even though we weren't there, and for Resurrection Life Church. And, and so, praise the Lord, it was all good. We are, uh, we're going forward, and we will not be hindered. And uh, so anyway, that was a good thing. Um, uh, last night, uh, Brother uh, Reverend um, Jim Crabb spoke. I don't know if any of you saw that. And he talked about 
uh, this life that we live, it's a, um, it's a lifelong journey, this spiritual walk. It's, it's going to take you your whole life. And, you know, I just might throw in there that the battle's not going to stop either. But you're going to rise above it. And so um, you're going to be okay. It's going to be good. But you can never stop. you got to keep moving forward. And, you know, he said that... Um, Every time that you read your word, that you come to church, that you read a, a God-inspired book, you're, it's like having a spiritual meal, and you've heard that before. So he said, you know, one meal does not a, a, a healthy diet make, but you have to continue to eat and eat and eat. And I told Rick, I said, well, maybe I'm bringing him a little sandwich this morning. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, it's a gourmet meal. So praise the Lord for that. But... I just want to encourage you to continue to eat spiritual food. And that's how you're going to grow, and that's how you're going to be strong, and that's how you're going to rise above the evil of this day. And so it's important. I, I'm going to bring you a meal, but you need to have another one later on, and then again tomorrow, and then later on, and then the next day, and, and so and so, and on and on, and it's never going to stop. I want to say hello to my good friend, Lori Falvey, who is here all the way from China. Lori, uh, let's give her a big hand clap because she... <laughs> if you knew Lori, like I know Lori, you would just love her to death because she's a, she is an awesome uh, woman of God. She it was a part of our team up north, and uh, was it three years ago, Lori, that two years ago? Lori um, went to China, and she actually teaches English in China. And uh, she has uh, met a wonderful, godly man. And uh, Sachin, is Sachin, and he's here with us today. So I, I just wanted to introduce you to them. They're, they're awesome. Lori Falvey is the, one of the most funnest, fun people that I've ever known. So praise the Lord for her. It's good to be have fun, isn't it? And have Christian friends that are just a riot, right? So shake Lori's hand. And then my twin sister is here today. And, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> okay, she's not really my twin sister, but people ask us that sometimes. And I always say, yeah, because I'm four years older than her. So uh, I'm glad that she's here today. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for coming. Oh, my aerobics instructor is here too. <laughs> Please don't judge me by the shape of my body because I got to tell you, I've done no exercise all summer. But, um, you know, summer, this makes me mad, actually, because on the 5th of July, all the red, white, and blue went out of the stores and they brought in the notebooks and the pencils and, you know, it's back to school. And I'm like, wait a minute, we got a whole nother month. It, it really kind of made me mad, but... I guess that's what they have to do for marketing's sake. But uh, anyway, I've been thinking about exercising. <laughs> so I have a whole month to think about it. And then when your class starts, I will be there. And I will be faithful even more so than last year to be there. So I thank God for you. You're a gift. Amen. You should all join me at Roxanne's exercise class. <laughs> Some of you especially. So, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, that's where I've been this summer too. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to do in the summer is read books. I, I love to read, and in the summer, I give myself permission to read um, novels about the beach about islands, about the cottage, about, you know, the summer home. It's usually rich people. I like to read about that. It's, a, it's good entertainment, right? I read books about um, sisters, about um, mothers and daughters. I like books like that. And so I'm really drawn to them. I just read a book about a restaurant. And, you know, I said to Rick after I got done, you know, I've been thinking about opening a restaurant. <laughs> He said, no, you're not. But <laughs> we, need, we need one. 
And we need another one, right? Somebody who's got some clout, would you let somebody know we need another good restaurant here in this city? It won't, I, Rick won't let me do it, so. Um, but I've also been reading another book. It's called Dress to Kill. Now, my good friend Corey, she likes all them, you know, what does she call them? Um, stab, murder, kill, forensic file stuff. I hate books like that. My books have to have, they have to end happily, or else I'm mad. I guess I've been mad a lot lately today, haven't I? <laughs> I throw them right in the trash. I have to read the whole thing, but when I'm done, if that book ticked me off, it goes right in the trash. But Dress to Kill, I'm reading Dress to Kill, I'm almost done, and um, the subtitle is, You Don't Have to Take It Anymore. It's, it's written by Rick Renner. If you know him, you should read it. It's a really good book. It's a biblical approach to spiritual warfare. And, you know, I was wondering what I was going to speak to you about today, and I thought maybe that was it. But, um, no, God said no. He had something else in mind. And um, so I'm going to give him all the glory in advance for whatever comes out of my mouth because... Uh, <laughs> Because, you know what, maybe people who do this every day, they, they have like, they know what they're going to talk about in advance. And I just kind of got surprised, and um, I am not um, away from God ever, even when I'm away from church. And so I just began to pray and said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to tell the people? See, I know that on my own I can do no good thing. I don't want to stand up here and give you Diane because it, it might be hilarious, but it wouldn't help you. Uh, <laughs> so I want to give you a word from the Lord. And I believe that he gave me one for today. So I'm going to, we're going to hold him accountable for that. And uh, I better pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just come before you now, and I ask, Father, that you would anoint my mouth to speak your words, Father. I ask also that you would anoint the hearer, Father, that you would give them ears to hear. Um, and, Father, I just praise you and I thank you because you gave me a word, Father, and I pray that it would accomplish that which you sent it for, Father. And I want you to be glorified in everything that I do and say, and so I give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you turn your Bibles to Ephesians 6 and 10. I actually brought my Bible. I'm going to maneuver this giant thing because it's what I do at home. And I want you, uh, even if you brought a smaller version, I want you to maneuver your way through as well. It's good for you. When you get there, say, I love the word. Ephesians 6 and 10. Well, let's just read it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, I believe we're at, we live in an evil day, don't we? We need the armor of God. You know, Paul, I thought, found this very interesting. Um, Paul wrote these letters after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were the, the men who walked with Jesus. Uh, the next books are called the Pauline Epistles. There are letters that Paul wrote to the churches that he had begun and, and that he had helped um, in a, what was Asia Minor at the time. And so he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. And he wrote this letter actually while he was in prison. And so while Paul was in, um, in prison, he started drawing these co uh, correlations from looking at the Roman guards that were guarding him. 
He was chained and he was held captive by trained killers. And they were trained in the skill of warfare. And so as Paul looked at these Roman guards that he saw he was in prison a lot, um, he began to draw this correlation uh, about our spirit life and how we should be clothed in armor, just like these guards have their physical bodies clothed in armor. Are you following me? So first of all, uh, their armor was very impressive. And Paul noticed that they had a huge breastplate. This breastplate w went from their neck down to their hips. It, it was hinged at the top, and it covered their front and their back. Sometimes they were all like little scales, like a coat of mail or something would be. Um, but they, they, were, um, they were heavy. They were beautiful in some instances, and um, they were very big. They also had these massive shields, and they were full-length shields. Have you, ever, have you seen uh, riot pictures of riot police where they have these full-length shields that go all the way from their head to, their, to the ground, and our guys got a little window that they can peek through, but even back in Paul's day, they had these huge shields that would cover their whole body. These shields were made of, of many layers of leather in the beginning, and they had to oil them regularly to keep that, that leather uh, strong. You know what happens to leather shoes if you get them wet and then they dry out, then they become brittle. And so they had to maintain their shields every day and to keep themselves protected. They also had brutal shoes. Their shoes, I think they were the first golf cleats, you know. <laughs> they had spikes in the bottom, and it held them in their place when they were doing battle. So, and, and also, they would use these shoes. I, I've never seen a golfer do this, but I imagine he could. They would use these shoes to actually kick people, and uh, they could do damage because there were spikes in the bottom of their shoes. They had intricate helmets. Some of them were very beautiful. They might be all carved with pictures. They covered the sides of their faces. You know, pretty much they were designed to keep their heads on because anyone in the battlefield without a helmet could lose their head quickly. Some of these um, helmets had great big plumes of horse hair or feathers. They might be very ornate. They were very beautiful and intricate. They had swords, all kinds of swords, piercing swords. They had... Um, these long, heavy swords that, that you know that they practice with. They, they worked out. They had to be strong to be able to carry these heavy swords. They were sharp on one side and dull on the other, and you had to be very strong to be able to wield these swords. I guess that's why your shoes had to stick to the ground, or you'd be flopping all over everywhere. I actually read about one battle where the soldiers... Um, they, they had these heavy swords, and they, uh, they won the battle. But when, while, when they were plundering their enemies and, you know, picking up, stealing them, robbing them, they were dead, so I guess they didn't need it, they noticed that they had short, these guys had shorter swords, and they were sharpened on both sides. And so then the army began to use that kind of a sword because it was, it was lighter weight, it was easier to carry, it, did, it was, was easier to inflict great damage and death. And then somebody got smart and said, let's hook the end a little bit. And so that some of their swords had a curved hook on the end. So they could, they'd slice that thing into your belly and then they'd twist it and then they'd pull it out. And there would come your guts all over the ground. <laughs> oh, God, let's not. Oh God, I'm sorry. I, I don't hold you accountable for this. Um, but it's true. And you know what? The battles were deadly. You've seen the movies. Do you want to be on that front line? No. I, th I can't even watch that. I just think it's horrible that men would have to do that, kill each other like that. But... That's war. They had short little daggers that they kept strapped to their side that they would use in close combat. Um, and then they also had lances, which were long, and they were um, especially tooled to be thrown at a distance. So they had all these tools for battling their enemy. And then they had the loin belt. 
And the loin belt, you know, you think about a belt that holds up your pants. The loin belt actually held all the armor in place. Without the loin belt, their shields would fall off. They wouldn't have anything to hook their sword on. And so they wore this loin belt to hold it all in place. You might not be able to see it, but boy, if it wasn't there, you would know because this guy would be falling apart. And so Paul, now remember, Paul's in prison and he's been guarded by these, these strong Roman soldiers held captive. He didn't, it wasn't pretty. I'm glad they let him write while he was in here so that we have all his words. But he drew this correlation between the way the Roman guards looked and spiritually what we need to do to protect ourselves. And so he went on to say, <clears throat> go to um, verse 14 in Ephesians 6. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which with, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, that's where I'm going to stop. Paul just took all these, all these pieces of armor, and he likened them to what a Christian should have, what a, queer, a Christian should wear. And each piece, he told us what it would do. He said to gird your waist with truth. He called the breastplate righteousness, right standing with God. He called our, those shoes gospel shoes of peace. He said that big shield that you stand behind, that's faith. He called your helmet salvation. And he said that the, the sword is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to stick on one point here, though. I want to talk about the loin belt. Because that's the direction that God led me for this morning. The loin belt is the belt of truth. And it is the truth that holds it all together. Amen? And remember, without the truth, it's going to fall all apart. You're not going to be protected. And so we're going to talk about that for a minute. Um, I want you to go now to John chapter 18. We're going to start with uh, verses 12 and 13. Now, this is um, the account of uh, Jesus was in the garden with his disciples, and he knew that his hour had come and uh, that they were coming for him. And he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for us. Did you know that? He prayed for all believers. And then, go to verse 12. The detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Ananus, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest for that year. He was praying in the garden when this group of thugs came to arrest him. They were sent by the church. And they came to arrest him, and they took him, and they, they sent him to Ananus first. Now, I thought that this was interesting because Ananus was a corrupt former high priest. He was no longer the high priest, but he used to be. He was corrupt, and he had been removed from office. He had five sons who succeeded him in office. Obviously, he still had power because they took Jesus to him. He questioned Jesus, and then he struck him, and then he bound him, and then he sent him to Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas was his son-in-law. He was also the current high priest. In the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 26, it tells us that Caiaphas had already met with religious leaders secretly, and they had designed a plot to kill Jesus. They wanted him dead. And, the, and they, remember now, this is the high priest. 
And they met in secret at night. They come up with this plot. They're going to lie about him. They're going to say all kinds of things about him because they have one goal. They want him dead. So um, Caiaphas, they decided let's not do it during the Passover, you know, because we don't want to cause an uproar among the people. So Caiaphas charged him with blasphemy and then sent him on to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor. And we're going to pick up verse um, 29 of chapter 18 in the book of John. Pilate then went out from them, out to them. They were bringing Jesus in, and he said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, Well, if he were not an evildoer, we, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. See, they didn't have the authority, but they had the plan. They wanted him dead. Um, verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again. He came back out to the common hall is what it is. He called Jesus and he said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered and said, are you speaking for yourself or did somebody tell you that? And Pilate answered and said, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And this is my key scripture right here, verse 38. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and he said, I find no fault in him. It was customary that during the Passover, one criminal would be released. And he asked the, the mob, the crowd, do you want me to release your king, the king of the Jews? And they cried, no, crucify him. But don't call him. I thought this was funny. I just, this is my own sense of humor. But uh, they said, but don't call him king of the Jews because he's not our king. But, you know, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, there was a little sign over him that said, King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And so, Christ was crucified. But I want to go back again to Pilate's question. He said, what is truth? And that's really the question that God laid on my heart for this uh, congregation this morning because I realize that it sounds very much like the day that we live in. People don't know what the truth is. There's so many liars in our society that nobody knows what's true and what's a lie. Oh my gosh, we got rid of our TV. We just have Hulu, Netflix, like a lot of the rest of you because we're just so sick of listening. My husband's kind of a news fanatic. He likes to watch the news. I can't take it anymore. Who, who's telling the truth? Are any of them telling the truth? You know, I think, I think this is funny. I think, yeah, you know, I read stuff on the internet and I think that it's funny that the thing that's so refreshing to a lot of people about Donald Trump is that he'll just say what he's thinking. You know, I'm not advocating or uh, supporting any particular candidate. I'm just saying we are so sick of lies. That's the society that we live in. And, you know, it doesn't sound like it was any different in Jesus' day. Look at how crooked the church was. Of course, they didn't know that they were doing the will of God because God sent his son to die for us. But they didn't know they were doing the will of God. They were trying to get rid of him. And they were crooked and they were corrupt and they lied and they coerced stories. They made up stuff. Kind of sounds like the day that we live in, doesn't it? It's sad. It's the, um, the, the power of, 
of the internet, of television. You know, years ago I had a, a store when we lived in Gladwin, and every morning I would drive from my house to the store about, I don't know, 12, 15 miles. And it was on the country, but I noticed that every single house I passed, just before dawn or maybe just at the breaking of dawn, every house had that indiglo, blue glow of the television going on. And it made me realize what power TV has in the lives of all people to speak into your life. They're speaking into your life. Are they telling you the truth? I don't think so. I think that, you know, I, I have to laugh at some of the stuff that's even on the Internet. And, and, you know, unfortunately, there are people who think if it's been printed in a magazine or if it's on the Internet, then it has to be true. Oh, my gosh, please don't be that silly. I, I just think there are people out there just making up stuff to see how many people will fall for it. Right? Have you read the one about hang a bag of pennies in a... Ziploc baggie of water and pennies, put them in your Ziploc baggies and then nail them up around your porch post because the flies won't come to your house if you do that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it works. Maybe it works, but I just think there's people somewhere going, oh my gosh, can you believe it? How many people got baggies of pennies nailed up at their house? I don't know. You know, I don't know that we can trust our government, our politicians, our news reporters, sometimes even the medical profession. Please don't be offended if you work in the medical profession. There are good and bad people in every arena, but there are some in the medical profession you cannot trust. What about even in agriculture? It makes me so angry that our food is poisoned. And, and, you know, I, I want to say, if you're in agriculture, I'm not, ta I love you. I'm not talking about farmers that work hard. I love farmers. But there are conglomerations and, and greedy corporate people that just want the money. They don't care what they're doing to anybody. That angers me. Even in our relationships, in our families, do people lie? We're not, none of us are exempt from, from lies. And, you know, I, I pose this question to you again. What is truth? I'll tell you what truth is not. It's not whatever makes people feel good. Because bad news can still be true. Truth is not what the majority says or he who has the most followers. Because even the majority can be in error. Right? Truth is not what's been studied the most or the longest. The conclusion could still be wrong. Truth is not simply what is believed, because a lie believed is still a lie. There's all these different philosophies out there. You've seen them on the Internet, Facebook, a lot of different places. I hate to even talk about this, but God's made, he told me to do it, so I'm going to. There's the philosophy of relativism. No, there, that, and relativism believes that there's no such thing as absolute truth. But can you believe that? Absolutely. There's the philosophy of skepticism. They doubt all truth. But is the skeptic skeptical, skeptical of skepticism? It's a self-defeating claim that you can't know truth, but then claim that this is true, right? There's postmodernism. It says that there's no particular truth, but how can that be true if there's no particular truth? There's pluralism that claims that all truths are equally valid, but can two opposing claims both be true? The spirit behind pluralism is tolerance. There's a word you're familiar with. Everybody is right. If everybody's right and nobody's wrong, well, then we'll just be one big happy family, right? That's not the truth. 
Why is truth important? Because life has consequences for being wrong. There's a, a Christian uh, author named Ravi Zacharias. I've read his books. He said this. He said, eternity is an awfully long time to be wrong. <laughs> but, you know, everybody wants to know the truth. Nobody wants to believe a lie. Not one of us want to be fooled or deceived. You know, there was a, a gal who came here not too long ago seeking the truth and she, I had an appointment with her in my office. Um, just on a side note, if you need somebody to talk to, I have an office here and I'm available. People always say, oh, you're so busy. No, I'm not. I'm not too busy to minister to you. This particular gal, she didn't show up. Please don't do that. But you know what, when she was called, she, apparently she's decided to follow the Jehovah Witnesses. I just want to say that you need to be careful not to look for truth in the wrong place. Because you can be deceived. Jesus said, y'all know this one, I am the truth, the way, and the life. He said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way, but Jesus is also the truth. Here's, here's one of my favorite scriptures. He says, Jesus said this, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Who doesn't want to be free? Oh, my gosh, I am free. I want you to know that I am free. And it is the best life I have ever had. You know what? Before I was free, I was bound. But I'm not bound anymore. I'm free. I found the truth. And he set me free. How do you know what the truth is? Well, Jesus, you know, he doesn't leave us in the dark. He said, if you'll abide in my word... My word will abide in you. You'll be my disciples. You'll know the truth, and it will set you free. This is actually uh, the verse just before, 831. The day that we live in is so evil that we have to know the truth. You have to know what the truth is because I promise you, all around you there are people that are lying to you. I mean, I'm not saying they're they're doing it on purpose or that they want to hurt you. They don't know the truth either, perhaps. We need to know the truth. The day that we live in is evil, and we need to know the truth. I was actually um, on Facebook the other day, and somebody, I can't even remember who. I don't remember who. Somebody posted an article um, that had a list of prophecies in it that were given. The first one was Smith Wigglesworth. And, you know, I don't know, when did he live? 1800 or something like that? A long time ago. There were a number of different uh, men with a gift of prophecy that spoke in this article. And Dr. Barclay, who is my pastor, was one of them. And so I caught my attention. I actually shared it on my Facebook. So if you're my friend, you can get on my Facebook and on my news feed and you can read it. Now, if you're a man, you're not my friend. And I'm just going to say that. I, I love you as my brother in Christ, but my husband and I have a, have a covenant. I don't have any men friends on my Facebook, and he doesn't have any women friends on his Facebook. So if you are a man and you have friend requested me, I'm sorry, you've been denied. Um, but if you ask a girl to get on my Facebook, you can read this. So just thought I'd throw that in there so you know. I have one guy, he's actually a board of directors. He, like, friend requested me, like, a whole bunch of times. And then I, he came here, and I had to go tell him face-to-face, -face, I'm sorry, I can't be your friend. <laughs> so, anyway, there were a whole list of prophecies. It was, you know, quite a long list. And there are prophecies about the day that we live in. Now, this one was written by my pastor in 1980. And here's what he saw. I'm going to read it to you. 
he said, I remember in the vision that I asked the Lord, what is this? What is this evil, temptu temp tempuous, temptuous, dark cloud? The Lord said, this is what I showed my prophet Isaiah. This is every evil thing you can name. It's every demon, it's every disease, it's every sickness and bacterial attacks that haven't even been discovered yet. It will cause humans to do things to humans that aren't even human. It's filled with insanity, and many people will lose their mind and their faculties. It is murder, terror, rape, abuse, terrorism, torture, and much worse. It is filled with deceptions, heresies, perversions, and filth. Some things the Lord showed me I've not had permission to speak, he said. I also saw people, many, many people. Some were running in to that dark cloud, and some were getting sucked into it. It reminds me of this powerful shop vac I have. It will not only suck up the dirt, but also my tools if I don't pay attention. I saw many people screaming with terror and actually being dragged into this cloud. Though they were refusing it and resisting it with all their strength, they did not possess the power to stop it. I was so disturbed when I saw a cross on someone's pocket or jewelry. I remember saying to the Lord, who are those people being drawn into this filth and terror, wearing the Christian symbol of the cross? Who are these people not even resisting? And who are these people resisting with all their might, but it does them no good? They just keep disappearing into this horrible, evil cloud of gross darkness. The Lord answered and said to me, these are those who do not have clean hands and a pure heart. They've been warned, but they ignore the warnings. Some even wanted this filth as a part of their lifestyle. I asked, well, who are these wearing the cross? And the Lord said, these are the people who claim me as Savior. Many of them have desired this filth, and they've even fought for it. They make excuses, but they're not excused. The ones who are resisting thought my prophets were exaggerating and from the old school, and they denied the warnings. Now this evil time has come. They possess little to no power and certainly not enough to resist and overcome this horrible onslaught of en enemy power. Only those with clean hands and a pure heart will be able to fully resist this. It will cover the earth. Didn't Pastor just uh, talk the other day about uh, darkness covering the earth, gross darkness covering the people? This was written in 1980. But I think it's a pretty good um, description of the time that we live in today. lost my place. Well, God led me on this journey, and I want you to know the truth. But then once you know the truth, you have to apply it. It doesn't do any good if your Bible just sits on the dresser and you never open it up. Pastor Joni, uh, Brother Joni, preached on Wednesday night a powerful message about the passionate pursuit of God. And I want you to know, Joni, that it inspired me. He talked about he has to get up at 6.30 in the morning in order to have time to spend time with God, to read his Bible and to pray and to talk to God. And, uh, you know, I'm not in that season of life anymore. My kids are grown. I can sleep till noon if I want. I don't, but I could. And the other morning I woke up at 7 o'clock and I, I woke up and I looked at the clock and then I thought, eh, I don't want to get up yet. And then immediately this rose up in me, spirit or flesh? Who are you going to cater to today, spirit or flesh? And so I popped my flesh up like toast and I got out of that bed. I make me a pot of coffee. Don't got to be in too big a hurry got my Bible and, and went and, and read it. And you know why I read it? Because I want to learn how to do it. I need the grace of God to empower me to do what I cannot do myself. But if I never read his word, how am I going to know what the truth is? How am I going to know who to follow? Right? So you got to read it 
and you got to do it. And I, I want you to take this seriously. You know, I ask God, what does this have to do with where we're at in our journey, pursuing you and pursuing your presence and pursuing your glory? It has everything to do with that. Because if you don't know the truth, you're not going to enter in to the presence of God. You won't. You'll be stuck there in your, in your seat with your lead boots on. And, you know, I, I told Pastor the other day when uh, uh, there was a word. My good friend Vicki Wadsworth gave a word. She said that God was calling us to step out, step out. Step out. She said it like five times. Step out. Step out. I was standing there waiting for people to step out, and nobody stepped out. And I looked at my feet, and I thought, are we wearing lead boots? Now, you may be sitting in your seat thinking, well, I don't have to move. I used to say, I ain't, I ain't, I'm not going to raise my hands, and they can't make me. <laughs> that was before I knew the truth. But you know what? I told Pastor later, I said, I had a word, too. It was a Taylor Swift song, Shake It Off, Shake It Off. <laughs> and I said, I know it was God because I don't listen to Taylor Swift. I, know, I don't know that I've ever even heard that whole song, but it came up in me, Shake It Off, Shake It Off. You know, sometimes you just got to shake yourself off. And you got to make your flesh do what it doesn't want to do because the sons and the daughters of God are led by their spirit. Not by their flesh. Sorry, Pastor, I wasn't going to tell that Taylor Swift story, but it just came out. <laughs> you know what, ladies and gentlemen? We are too far down the road to play with danger. It's too late in the day. I'm sorry. There may have been a day when you could dance around with God and decide whether you're going to be obedient or disobedient, but i got to tell you, for me, that day has come and gone. And it is time to be attentive to the word of the Lord and then to do it. And if you don't feel like you have the strength or the ability, then you call on the grace of God to empower you to do what in your own power you don't have the ability to do. You know, I recently heard some gossip. I don't like gossip, uh, mostly because we are called as uh, the children of the king to not be gossipers. Now, we've all stood at the checkout line reading the headlines on all the magazines, and that's just gossip. But you know when it really hurts? I'm sure it hurts those people who are being gossiped about, but it hurts when, it, when it, it's going on about your family or people that you love. I heard some gossip the other day about so-and-so. You know, they left the church uh, and because of so-and-so, you know, and it was not true. It was not true. It was not the truth. As a matter of fact, so-and-so didn't leave the church. They're sitting in this congregation right now. But see, gossip, listen, it could rise up in you. It could. But you've got to take authority over it. You've got to stop your mouth. You know what Jesus said? If your right hand causes you to sin, well, cut it off and cast it away from you because it is better for you to enter into eternity single-handedly than to end up in the fires of hell. I don't know. If your mouth causes you to gossip, put some tape on it or something. Make a note. Remind yourself. Just stop. Just stop. Just stop. You know what? Somebody else said to me just recently that they heard that, that I have no friends and nobody likes me here. <laughs> now listen, you laugh, but this... This sister was brokenhearted for me. And I said to her, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Now, there might have been a day in my life when that would have hurt me, but that day has come and gone. That didn't hurt me. But I want you to know, that's not the truth. So why did my good sister have this burden? Well, she believed a lie that was designed to hurt somebody. Maybe it was designed to hurt me, it didn't hurt me, but you know what, it hurt her. Because she was burdened for me, because she cares for me. 
I, I just want to exhort you this morning, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. Stop. You need to find out the truth. Find the truth. Stop believing lies and start believing the truth. You know what? This, this book right here, this is the word of God. Jesus said, I am the word. Jesus said, I am the truth. This book right here contains the truth. And it will change your life. It changed mine completely. You can ask my sister, no, don't, about what I used to be like. But I'm sweeter now, aren't I? Uh. <laughs> I was always awesome, she said. No, this word of God, this is the truth. It can change your life. It changed my life. I used to be burdened and bound. I had a drinking problem. Well, let's just say that. And you know what goes along with that. I was addicted to some other stuff, and I had a rotten mouth. And, you know, I hurt people in relationships because that's all a big package deal right there. And I, I was burdened with it because I couldn't just walk away from it. It followed me. It directed me. But you know what? I'm free. I don't have that burden anymore. I'm free. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. That's why you've got to read this book. Pastor or our Brother Joni, you know, exhorted us on Wednesday. Get up and read your book. I don't care if you read it in the morning or in the afternoon or at night. Whatever works for you. But you've got to read this book. This is the only book in the library that you could read over and over and over. I've been reading it for 27 years. For 27 years. Think about that. For 27 years, I've been reading the same book. And it continues to speak to my life and to change me. The Bible tells us that our minds are renewed by the washing of the water of the word. It changes your mind. It changes your mind. You know what? Before your actions are going to change, really, your mind needs to change right? I, I remember years ago going to uh, visiting a church service uh, 25 years ago uh, at Christmas time, and, and uh, somebody said, don't go to that church. They brainwash people there. And I said, well, you know what? Most people need their brains washed. <laughs> We need our brains washed with the water of the word. When once our mind is changed, <laughs> once our mind is changed, our actions change, our behavior change, our word change, our words change, our life changes. Amen. I used to be broken, but now I'm whole. I want you to know the truth. God wants you to know the truth. That's all I got to tell you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for your word. Father, it's truth. It's transformed my life. And Father, were we to take a poll, I bet you 75% of the people in this room, maybe more, would say that the truth of your words has changed their life too. Father, I thank you for sending your word. I thank you, Father, for truth, Lord God, in a land that is full of lies and deceit and deception and pain and brokenness, hatred, every evil thing. There's truth. Father, I thank you for that truth. And I pray right now for every person in this room, every person who might be watching uh, through the uh, stream. Father, I pray that you would rise up on the inside by your spirit, a desire to know the truth that we can walk in it. And Father, when somebody asks us, what is truth? We can say, we can, we can share the hope that we have found, the answers that we have found in your word that have changed our thinking 
and changed our lives. Father, I praise you and I thank you for that. And Father, I'm going to be so bold as to say, Father, we as a church desire to be in your presence, Father, to be changed by your word, to be touched by your spirit, Father, to be transformed in, by your glory. There's some things, Father, that we can't do on our own. We need your grace to help us. And Father, I just praise you today that we are not on our own but that you live in us, you live through us. You promise never to leave us or forsake us, that you are truth and you are freely available to us each and every day. I praise you and I thank you for that. Now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus like I do, you don't know the truth, you wanna know the truth, but you don't know the truth. Is there anybody in this room that I could pray for? If there is, just raise your hand real quick. I'm not going to call you up here. Anybody who doesn't know Jesus? All right. We're all saved. We're all set free. I pray that we all get delivered. I pray that we can all say I'm healthy, I'm whole, I'm happy, I'm free. I pray, Father, that you would do your work upon the face of the earth. Father, have mercy on us. Deliver us from evil, Father. Give us strength and courage and grace, Father, for the days ahead. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.